everybody. I'm Debbie Montgomery Johnson, founder of the nonprofit The Woman Behind the Smile, and your host of Stand Up and Speak Up, a show that is about each and every one of us. Many of us have something, something we're hiding, something we're ashamed of, something not through no fault of our own or through our own making we keep hidden, and that in turn keeps us hidden from each other and the world. Good people go through terrible situations. Wise people know when and how to let it go. Everything that happens to us helps us grow, and while it may be hard to see it right away, the most important thing to do is to change your perception about your circumstances. Regardless of what your personal experiences or traumas have been, this showcase series is designed to ignite the light in you, as well as providing safe harbor, education, personal growth, and resources so that no matter where you are on your journey, you'll have the courage to move on when you're ready. Stand Up and Speak Up features ordinary people who've been through extraordinary situations and struggles and found the courage to step out from behind their smiles and speak up about their experiences and the lessons gleaned from those experiences. Everybody heals at a different pace, and we recognize that. So come on in, have a listen, and enjoy the ride at your own speed. It's another day in paradise, and this is Debbie coming to you from beautiful South Florida, It is a wonderful day down here, although I am looking to get a little bit of rain because I just put some new crepe myrtles in and they're beautiful, but I need some water. (laughs) I don't want to go out with a hose. So anyway, welcome everybody. I'm so excited to have you here today. I have a very special guest. She and I met online through, it was kind of like a Facebook hookup for podcasters. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a great way of putting it. Yeah. I can put it. And uh, I was, I was a pleasure. It was a pleasure to be on her show. And I'm thinking, Oh my gosh, I have to have you on my show because we had such fun and everybody. I'd like to introduce my guest today, Kat Cantrell from Iowa. (laughs) Yes. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Woke her up early today to come on the show. And uh, I'm so excited you're here because I'm so excited to be here. What you are doing is really important. And we're going to get to that because I have so many different questions. And folks, I was telling the ladies that got on early, if you want to hear a little bit more about what Kat has done, there's a great YouTube video. It's in the chat. Click on it after the show uh, because she was being interviewed by four single middle-aged guys. And I I took copious notes. (laughs) (laughs) That's wonderful. Yes. What I like to do with my show, Kat, is go back in time. I want, my, yeah. I want my folks to know who you are. Where did you grow up? Did you have any siblings? And let's get into that. And then we're going to move into your stuff because it's fascinating. So tell me, who is Kat? Oh, my gosh. Uh, well, thank you so much. I just love being here. And what an incredible format. And what just an incredible cause that you are um, serving and feeling called to do. It's just I love the work that you're doing. And so I'm just so incredibly honored to be a part of your show. So thank you. Thank you so much. I would get up earlier for you. I mean, (laughs) my pleasure. I mean, even if you said 6 a.m., I'd be like, I'm there. Um, So, yeah, a little bit about me. So uh, I was born and raised in the Southwest. I um, was born in Phoenix and I uh, grew up uh, with very, a very, I would say a not healthy relationship when it comes to like knowing what relationships are. So my parents divorced when I was five and both parents decided, um, you know, after they divorced, they, each of them had married several different times and had divorced several different times. So I grew up in, even though I felt that, um, I had the stability of, of my mom, it was just always, it just, it always was just kind of like, the love that I felt was just, it was either there or it wasn't there. And watching my mom navigate through multiple relationships and watching my father navigate through multiple relationships, it really kind of left me extremely confused on what is, (laughs) what is a healthy relationship? What isn't? And I think back then, uh, both of my parents, I think the pressure of being in a relationship, especially with my mom being a single mom, I have a younger sister So when my mom divorced my dad, my sister and I were only five and one. So there was a lot of pressure back in the seventies and early eighties to remarry again, Mm -hmm. to have that family unit. It wasn't as acceptable as it is now to, uh, 
support single moms and single dads the way that the, the cult, I mean, we're getting there, we're getting there. Uh, but I, um, so growing up, I was the all American girl. <laughs> I was, uh, went to church. I was captain of my dance team. I was a straight A student, uh, really just kind of, um, kept in my lane. And, um, when I went to college, I think, uh, for me, since I grew up in a very strict home, when you go to college, you kind of learn and explore and <laughs> like, oh, there's these new, new different things about my personality that I didn't know existed. And throughout college, um, my sophomore year of college is when I met my, what I call my future ex-husband. Um, I met him my sophomore year of college because even back then there was still pressure to go to college and get your MRS degree. That's mm -hmm. what they used to call it. Go to college and get your MRS degree. Mm -hmm. And when I originally went to school, I wanted to be a dance teacher because dance was my passion. It was always something that I felt really good in. It always was something that made me feel amazing and made me feel confident. And, uh, in Arizona high schools had dance teachers as a part of their curriculum. They had like a performance performing arts, uh, portion of the curriculum for high school. And so that's what I wanted to do. And so my freshman year of starting college, they completely dropped the dance program. And my mom had always, my mom was, um, very much, uh, she was in a corporate, she was, uh, in banking. So she, she always would tell me, you can't make a living dancing. Anyway, you need to find something else to do. This isn't reality. You can't do this. Uh, so I was really confused, dazed and confused quite a bit, trying to figure out my path as far as like career. And I stumbled upon my future ex-husband and decided to uh, just degree. And uh, my two focuses were sociology and psychology, but I just decided to get a liberal studies degree because that was the thing that was going to get me out of college the fastest. And so I graduated in May, got married in September because I was, uh, he proposed while we were in college and got married in September and settled in Detroit. I was not, uh, it was, I wanted to leave Arizona. I wanted to different, I wanted a different change. I wanted to kind of spread my wings and because of the, the home life that I was raised in, I just wanted to have something different for myself and have something different for my children, uh, potential future children. And so we settled in Detroit and very quickly, I would say within the first year and a half, I knew that marrying my ex-husband was probably one of the biggest mistakes I had ever made because as soon as we got married, even though the warning signs were already there prior to getting married, I feel like once we got married, things just got super bad, super, super quick. And, uh, living in Detroit, not having any family, his, he was originally from there. So his, his, his dad and his um, stepmom lived there and he had his whole community at high school friends, but I didn't really have anybody. And I was a stay at home mom. So I had my son. Um, we got married in 96 and I had my son in 98 and, uh, it was, I was finding myself very lost, very just unsupported, um, postpartum, just really miserable and not having the support of my, of my husband, because since I decided to stay at home, we had very much that 1950s kind of mentality in my home where, you know, I was to do all these things. He was to do those things and, you know, not getting any really, truly any kind of support, um, from him, uh, was something that I had to get accustomed to, unfortunately. And, when I, when I, when I started, when I quit working and I decided to start being a stay at home mom, it was something that I felt was like the, it was such a, to me at the moment, it was the greatest decision for my kids. My son was what they called high spirited. So he was very, yeah. very much a handful. And I always thought to myself, okay. Um, I always, I always said that my son was like a old man stuck in a baby's body. Like he was just so unhappy being a baby. Like some babies are so happy being babies. My son, absolutely not. Like, I felt like he was born with like a cigar and a cognac. Like, it's just like, <laughs> can we get to 30 already? It was just like, and I thought, oh my gosh, if I'm struggling, taking care of my own child, I can't even imagine someone else having to, um, you know, take care of him. So I, you know, to me, it's being a stay at home mom was probably one of the best decisions I could have ever made. And even though I felt like I was paying a price in my marriage, um, because it was a power struggle with my, um, ex-husband, I soon found, I mean, he was, 
um, alcoholic, uh, very verbally abusive, narcissistic, all of the, I mean, just, you know, exactly the type of person that I'm explaining when I, uh, talk about all these things. Um, and I remember, uh, I wanted to have another baby and it wasn't because I wanted to have another baby with my, and this is sounds, this is going to sound a little bit morbid, but it wasn't because I wanted to have another baby with my ex-husband necessarily. I wanted to have another baby. So my son wouldn't be alone in case something did happen to our marriage. So Mm -hmm. I like, even though I wanted to have another child, I also wanted to have another child for my son. So we didn't, if whatever happened in the future, I mean, I was so fearful of what was going to happen in the future that I wanted to make sure that he wouldn't, my son wouldn't go through it alone. And so I, um, without going into huge amounts of details about that, about that situation, um, my daughter ended up being a surviving twin. And so I lost a child in that whole process. And after that was done, I was like, I'm done having children, (laughs) but doing this, the marriage was even taking a much greater, horrible turn for the worst. And, um, I knew as soon as my daughter was born and after everything we went through that I knew I was done having children and I knew I needed to start making my plan to leave that marriage. Um, and so without having really a huge support system, I, uh, I had started working part-time. I was a part-time substitute teacher and a dance coach at a local high school at a local high school. And I absolutely loved it. And, uh, we went through the recession of 06, 07, 08, when like everything was just in Detroit, all the plants were shutting down. Everything was just kind of a huge chaotic mess. And so my ex-husband's contract had him come here to Iowa. And so we had moved here to Iowa and we had already reconciled our marriage once. And, uh, when we got here, I thought, oh my gosh, this is a new beginning. Like we're going into a new state. He had stopped drinking. I was like, okay, this is the solution. Maybe this is what it's going to happen. And that's going to change our marriage. And it just got worse and worse and worse. And I think I, I was working at that point. My kids were, they were five and eight and I was working full time in a local corporate company. And I was having to do everything. I was still having to do all the housework. I was having to take care of the kids. I was having to. And then I was, he was never home. And it was just, I just knew like, this is it. This is the time for me to leave. Um, And so one night he was, we were having a huge fight and he's like, do you want a divorce? And it just came out. And I said, yes, I did. Uh, And uh, it was a very long, drawn out. Uh, very difficult divorce. And um, it took about a year and a half to finally uh, be able to get that done. And he, in the process, had already found someone else, had already proposed to her, had already completely moved on and moved to another state, which really honestly was like the best thing in my kids' lives at that time. He was holding the kids against me. He was, it was a very toxic situation. And so to me, the farther away I can get him from my kids, the better, of course, they didn't understand it at that point in time. And I always said to myself, they're going to decide when it, whenever it's right for them, like when they become older, they're going to understand whatever that relationship is with their dad, but long story short of it. So my daughter's now almost 21. My ex-husband has only talked to her twice since she was 13. So that's the, just, that's that relationship. Um, so I had met my ex-husband when I was 19 and now I was 33 living in Iowa, not knowing anybody single mom of two kids. And then I'm going to start dating. Well, Um, before you get to that, I'm like, I'm sitting here going, what a brave woman to, hmm. to make that jump. Anyway, that's a really difficult thing to, to, especially as a stay at home mom. And then one working, um, have family that have done this and it not on she didn't choose to, to leave. <laughs> she was on the other end of that. You know, you're going to be gone. Um, very difficult. And I, and I really, my heart goes out to single moms. I mean, I was a single mom, but because Lou died and my kids were older, it's difficult when the kids are young, because there's just so much going on and it's hard mm-hmm. to, to explain to them why dad's not around without them thinking that it was their fault. So in the beginning, though, when you when you met him, because you, you were young, did any of your friends yeah. or family question or or say? Oh, 100 percent. Oh, did they? Because many yeah. times they don't. Oh. So what did they say? Yeah, um, it's funny because he um, 
I was so back then when I look back, um, I was so I, and I'm still this way where I'm very much the glass is, is half full. Uh, I, I believe in the best in everyone. Like I can see potential in everyone. And I think with him, I felt that it was almost like a lost puppy because he was so different and unique back then. Like he was four years older. He had served in the military. Like it was like this whole somewhat of a romantic story for me. Um, but immediately, as soon as I started dating him, I was, um, very much involved in my sorority and even my sorority sisters were like, what, what are you doing with this guy? Mm -hmm. Like, this is not good. And even my family was like, are you sure you're not settling? Are you sure? But to, to go back even further, like when I look at my relationship with my ex-husband, he is so similar to my past ex-stepfather. So now looking back in hindsight, the way that he treated me was the way that I saw my ex stepfather treat my mother. And so to me, it was like, this normal. is normal. Like, this is what love is like. This is to me. I didn't, you know, and I would see these glimpses in any time, if anybody's listening, any time that you have to, that you have to make excuses for someone's behavior, or if you have to say things like, well, you don't know him, how I don't know him, those kinds of triggering, like when you start saying things like that, that's when you should take a step back and go, all right, what's really going on here? Um, because yeah. And even my, when I got married, so my, my, um, my mother was not happy. Nobody was really happy. And I think that was part of my rebellion too, was that I'm going to marry this guy and I'm going to show you all wrong, which by the way, don't do that either. Doesn't work. Um, <laughs> doesn't work. Right. Um, so I, um, my mom had this story and she didn't tell me this until actually I was going through my divorce. And when I went through my divorce, like everybody was celebrating, like everybody was just thrilled that I was finally leaving, leaving him because he was extremely so abusive. Um, but when I, um, but it's different when it's emotional abuse versus physical abuse, right? Like people don't really see it because it's behind closed doors. And, um, but my mom's had the story that after I got married, she, we ha would have, we had this huge party that like a brunch the next day after my, after my wedding for all out of town guests. And so she has the story where she went to the deli counter and she was sobbing at a deli counter going, my daughter just made the biggest mistake of her life. By oh, no. man. So like, there were all these, like, like, it's almost like my family was like behind my back when I, when I married, um, when I married my ex-husband, but, um, with all of that said, I think it's important for me to mention that I don't, I wouldn't change it for multiple reasons. First, I wouldn't change my kids for anything. Like they are the most incredible human beings. Um, I'm grateful that I got out of the marriage when I did. So then that way I was able to raise them, um, in the way that I felt that they should have been raised and not around that kind of toxic behavior so that therefore it would set them up for success when they go to date and when they have relationships in their lives. But being in that relationship really taught me so much about um, myself, about what I wanted, about what I stood for. So, and I'm able to take those types of learning lessons and help women now or men now in their potential, like as they're going through divorces, especially when they're divorcing narcissistic um, exes. That's something that I have a lot of, you know, that I had an incredible amount of experience with. So I feel like I'm able to use those tools to help people. And that's really important because I think all of us go through something in our life that we think at the time is just insurmountable or, you know, damaging or just going to make us sit under a rock, but it's the turning yeah. that around. It's taking that pain point and turning it into your passion or your purpose. And, right. you know, I've talked and, you know, that's certainly what happened to me. I was talking to interview the other yes. day and I said 15 years ago or 12 years ago when 10 years ago, when Lou died, there's no way I would have told you I'd be sitting on this side of the story. No way. Right. It never would have happened to me. And I'm sure looking back, you, you know, growing up as a child thinking, oh, I'm going to have this happy marriage. And, and I loved being a stay at home mom. That was one of my favorite times. Mm -hmm. uh, I went back to work because we needed benefits. Um, but it, there's something about being there. And, and when you say it didn't work, oh my gosh, I think we worked harder as stay at home moms than I ever yeah. did going back to work because you're doing right. everything. But one important thing for me, when I, when I left the Air Force to be a stay-at-home mom, I sat down with the general I worked for, and he brought out this big black book and said, okay, Deb, what are you going to do now for the rest of your life? And I said, sir, I'm going home to raise my children. Closed that big black book up, and he sat there and goes, good for you. 
I'd love for you to stay in the Air Force because you could make a huge difference. However, you're going to change the lives of generations. And my wife did it and I encouraged you to do it. And it was the best thing I could have heard from a senior officer at that point. Cause I didn't like the ladies. Absolutely. The ladies I was trying to emulate were not the women I wanted to be. And so right. that was really important for me. And, and I've raised some like you, I've raised some really good children and I'm very, uh, yes. very proud of them. And now they don't like necessarily what I did 10 years ago, but right. they understand it now they're there. It changed our relationship in such a good way because now we're talking as adults and I'm thinking guys, if what happened to us puts us in a position to be there for somebody else, then that's what we need to do. It's not about us, you know, right. But when you were in that relationship though, because you weren't physically abused and hit, cause yes. you could walk into a police yes. department with a black eye. How right. did others look at it when you, well, I know how your family did, but was there anybody that yeah. said you shouldn't be leaving? You got, you got a family, you got kids, you got to stay with him. Anybody do that to you? Oh yeah. His family, his family did. Oh. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, his family, especially his mom would come to visit and she would watch how the dynamic was in the family and how he would speak to me. And she would always say things like, I didn't raise him to be this way. I didn't raise oh. him to be this way. Like it was always like this, like, um, conversation that her and I would have. And there were so many times where even his, so his mom and his aunt, I remember the first time. So the first time that I wanted to leave him, I was a stay at home mom. I was super scared because I didn't have a full-time job. My kids were much smaller. Uh, I, again, I felt like I didn't really have the support system. And I remember going attorney going like, is there any way that I can, you know, still stay home with my kids and divorce my ex-husband? And they're like, no. And I'm like, shoot. Okay. Well, (laughs) like, uh, decisions. Right. And, uh, I remember having conversations with both his, his mom and his aunt, and both of them said, do you know what you're going to do to him? If you decide to leave him, you know, he might commit suicide and he might do this and you are obligated. You, you know, you made an, you made a promise and you made an oath that you have to, and it almost felt like I took him off of their hands because he was such a toxic individual. So like I was doing them a favor by remaining married to him. Uh, so yeah, several different conversations and even like his father, uh, cause his father was in the same city that we were in and I would go and I would go and, um, they had a in-ground pool, which is like kind of unheard of in Michigan. So we would go to their in-ground pool and hang out with the kids. And even his dad would always look at me and go, what is he doing now? Like, it was always like, what, like what's going on? What is he doing now? And, um, so it's even though like, and it's the thing is to, to back, God, I haven't talked about this stuff in so long, Debbie, I can't, it's like, I'm, I'm going through archives in my head. Like all these other things are popping up. I remember, um, like a week before of getting married, his stepmother, his stepmother and him never got along. It was always a consistent ongoing friction in the family. And, um, she had called me, uh, a week before the wedding, begging me not to marry him. And she was like, you're going to make the biggest mistake of your life. Um, you know, why, why are you doing this? Like, she's like, he's a horrible person. And, and, you know, to me again, like he had filled me up with like, oh, these, all these other people are saying these lies about me. They're, they're all wrong. I'm right. To the point where, I mean, cause narcissist narcissists, this is what they do. They lie a lot. And to, um, so much so that, and you probably, this is going to, this is probably going to ping for you a little bit. So Mike's husband, um, he was in the Marines and, um, he, so when we met, he used to tell me about stories about Afghanistan and about being, you know, being a desert storm. Cause that's back then, you know, that was desert storm and come to find out they were never his stories. He never went to Afghanistan. The stories that he told me were his best friend's stories from going to, to and I didn't figure, I didn't know any of this until we um, actually were already married. And I was like, what does someone do with this information? The fact that like he created this romantic, oh, I served and I served our country when really what ended up happening is he only served three years for other different, he ended up getting out of the military due to drinking. So 
Like, I didn't know any of this. Right. So it's like, as you're, you know, married to someone. And I think it kind of like, it kind of, it's not the same. This is not apples to apples for what you went through by any means, but like you're living in this like facade or like this idea of who this person is. And as time goes on, it just starts to unravel. And you're just like, oh my gosh, what did I get myself into like this? And now I have two children and now it's like this. And how do I get out? And especially he was, um, we had a house full of guns full. I mean, it was just, there was a constant feeling of fear inside of me, um, throughout that entire time. So, yeah. Well, it, it, it is interesting and it's very much the same, you know, cause people say, how could you, how could you get involved in this? And I'm thinking, well, I know I have women, a friend of mine, Benita Alexander, she was an NBC reporter working with Meredith Figueroa and she met a man who's an international surgeon. She was going to get married to him. It was very public. They were going to get married by the Pope. She was flying back and forth to Italy, all over the world. And one of her girlfriends called her up one day and said, Hey, that day you're getting married by the Pope. He's going to be in South America. And that opened up this whole story of her, the, the fiance was indeed an international surgeon, but he was married, had a family in Europe. He had scammed basically the, the uh, world as far as what his surgery was. And so now she's like, now what do I do? Well, you can hide under a rock. You can say, oh my gosh, I'm so stupid. Why did I do all that? Or you can say, it's time to speak up. It's time to fight this. How do we expose this and how do we get out of it and protect ourselves? And that's what I love about what you did, because there was a time when it it was pretty dangerous and you got out of that situation, took your life by the horns here and started off and the hour is going by really fast. And I knew this was going to happen, but I wanted to get a feel of who you were and what is your why? Why are you doing what you're doing today? So that was one of my big questions here. What yeah. should, why, why are you doing today and tell everybody what you're doing, but why are you doing your work today? And did it have to do with what you went through in the past? Absolutely. So the work, yeah. So the reason why I uh, do the work that I do is to, so they always say in coaching that you want to help yourself. So mm-hmm. when you talk about your ideal avatar, it's basically a, a different it's a person who's very similar to who you, what used to be. And so in coaching, they say that you always want to help people who you were like five years ago. Now, granted the work that I'm doing now is someone who I was 10, 15 years ago, but, uh, I'm extremely passionate about helping people find love. And, uh, because I was misinformed, I, when I was, when I was a single mom and I was navigating the dating world in my thirties, trying to figure out, you know, I mean, even from things from, you know, when to have sex to when to do this, to when to go on a second date, just trying to like, who do you swipe right on? Who do you talk to? Who do you not? And just learning and navigating through those years and all of the uh, horrible stories, (laughs) things that I went through. Uh, I want to help. I want to just the work with you're doing. I want to prevent that. I want to help. I want to basically help single skip the line. I want to be that person that they can go to. Like, you know, an example, I had a, a woman who just signed on with me last night who was in my office and she was like, I don't have all of my friends are, are married or they're widowed. And I don't have anybody that I can come to, to talk about these, like the, my dating stories, because nobody understands what it's like to be single. Like no, unless, unless you've been in that situation and it's women like this, where I know that she can come to me and we can talk about what is she facing as a single person and how we can help her find her person faster. Um, so it's, you know, to me, this all organically happened. It's not like I went through the dating world and then found my, found my forever person who's Brian, who's the most amazing human ever. And, uh, you know, then decided to be a dating coach. It started with, uh, a dance studio that I opened up a local dance studio. Cause it all went back to my days of dancing and wanting to like, um, rediscover myself. Cause that's what ended up happening when I was single, where I was like, I was throwing myself in the dating world. And I was like getting dead end after dead end after dead end. And just like this functional relationship, my first relationship out of my divorce, the guy broke up with me by lying to me, telling me it's stage four brain cancer. And then it ended up being an entire lie. And I was like, and it made me step back going, what is going on? 
why am I attracting these types of people? And why am I allowing this to happen to myself? Um, to the point to where, you know, there are certain red flags that you can notice at the beginning. And to me, just spreading that awareness, exactly what just what you're doing, Debbie, right? Spreading that awareness, giving people those tools where they, when they start to talk to someone where it's like, mm, this maybe should be a red flag. You should listen to this. You should listen to your intuition, et cetera, et cetera. And so, um, when I opened the dance studio organically, I started coaching women, um, on confidence and loving themselves and discovering themselves. And then, with all of that, it led into dating coaching, which led into matchmaking. And, um, it all comes down to one thing, which is love, right? So it's helping people find love, whether it's within yourself, if that's what you need help with, or if it's actually helping you find your forever person. So many times that, that confidence and love of your love of yourself has to come first because you can't, You can't bring someone else in and think that they're going to fix you or that you're going to fix them. That's not. Oh yeah. And I love. I was listening on on the um, the show with the guys. You're talking about deal breakers. Many times we don't do this. So what are your what are deal breakers and how do you how do you talk to your clients about those things as they're getting into the dating world? Yeah, that's a great question. So deal breakers are your absolute no goes and because we can get caught up when we start to go on dates, we can get caught up in the, uh, vanity of it all of what this person looks like, as far as like a deal breaker. And we get, we, when we go into a date, if we don't have like a steady foundation of knowing our absolute no goes, we can start making excuses about someone's poor behavior because based off of what they look like, or they're by type. And we start to really, um, justify why we're ending up dating this person. And so it's important to have, to know what your absolute non-negotiables, right? Just know what the deal breakers are. So a lot of people it's, uh, smoking. So that's like, if you're not a smoker, you don't want to date someone who's a smoker. Um, a lot of the times it's, uh, children or no children. Like if they don't want to have children and you do, then that's a deal breaker. Um, like very simple things where, If a deal breaker is you're looking for a serious relationship, if someone says I'm looking for something casual in hopes of turning it into a serious relationship, they're telling you they want something casual. That is a deal breaker. So just really paying attention. And it's okay. I think too, it's okay to have needs. Like it's okay to have these deal breakers, especially for my women and men out there who are the people pleasers, who are the ones that just want to kind of, um, they want to be in a relationship so badly. So they'll make excuses. I think it's just really establishing what those deal breakers are can really set you up for success on any potential date. Because the moment you see that deal breaker, you already know to yourself that that's a no-go because you don't, you're not going to convince that person. I think that we, when men or women say the man is trainable or changeable, oh my gosh, that drives me absolutely up the wall. If you have to say that someone's trainable or changeable, run. That is not your person. It's time to move on to the next, right? Get a dog. (laughs) Gosh. Yeah. We're not, that's right. That's right. So I think it's, um, really understanding what you're looking for and what you're not looking for. And I think it could come down to location too, right? It's not that, um, I think it's, it's, the values and like, and the thing about it is that you can't get to really get to know all these things within the first couple of dates. When women come to me and they tell me, they tell me a non-negotiable is height. That's not a non-negotiable. Sorry. Sorry, ladies, not a non-negotiable, not, uh, not a thing. Um, I know that every woman is convinced that every man over six feet is like their dream guy, but that's not true. That is absolutely not true. So that's not a deal breaker. <laughs> but it is funny because my daughter is five eleven, and, and that's five, different. The guys, well, and the, the guys that lie about their height, I'm thinking, and, oh, the, yes. and their age. I'm like, you guys, as yes. soon as we see you, we know how tall you are. We know how old you are. Why are you lying about those? And if they're lying about that, then what else are they lying about? Is my question. That's right. Absolutely right. In fact, um, so I can go into all of this um, and I won't go into such a huge like deep dive, but they've done studies with online dating where we have put so much value into these vanity metrics because when as human beings, as humans, 
if we uh, consider something like with online dating, like you can't judge someone, whether they're honest, whether they're uh, giving, caring, kindness, like all of the core values of what is sustainable for a healthy growing relationship, but we can compare height, um, education, all of these things. So we put so much value into it as, because it's something that we can compare each other to. And even though it doesn't, it's not that value, it's doesn't that type of money and height, those types of things don't pertain to the success of a relationship, Mm -hmm. but they did a study where when, so if you had someone who's five ten or five, nine, and you were to bump into them in public, you wouldn't know the difference truly. Like if you were to see them, you wouldn't really know the difference between five, 10 and five, nine, but online it's, we've put so much value into it that we are making those, those very quick decisions on just an inch. And in fact, so much so that you as a man, height is so important online to the point where in order to attract more women, if you're shorter, you have to make $40,000 more every inch in oh order my. to get her attention. Wow. But I also heard so you. So if you're short, you have to be really wealthy. Oh my That's, gosh. And they are. Yeah. Uh, but I also heard you give a statistic that 70% of dating profiles are men. And when I heard that, I'm thinking, okay, of that 70%, how many are fake? In my world, it would be like 90% of those are fake. Yes. Um, So how do you get I mean, go ahead. How do you get your folks to to really dive into making sure that person is for real? Because I don't want them coming to me later on and saying, oops, I wish I heard your story. What are the tell, what are the, right. What are the things that you coach people on to say, this is a good profile. This is not because you are the dating buddy that I always say people need to have when they're doing it online. Yeah. You're the dating yes. buddy. So yes. hey, buddy, save me. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's not, a, it's not just that, uh, there's another statistic that 42% of Tinder profiles are people who are attached or married. So it's not just yeah. fake profiles, but it's also people who are in current relationships and, I know that there's polyamory and I know that there's couples that are seeking people and I get that, but that's not the work that I do. The work that I do is helping people navigate dating world and hopefully to help them, you know, find their person. So I have what I call the, so you can't, I think if it looks too good to be true, most likely it is. So that's number one. So for example, I'm here in uh, Iowa. I live in Cedar Rapids. Cedar Rapids is ranked uh, the second largest city in the state of Iowa behind Des Moines. We have other, we have um, 99 counties in Iowa, lots of small towns here. And uh, one of my clients had said that she had matched with somebody. I don't, I don't remember. Maybe she was on OkCupid possibly. And the guy looked like he was from Greece, like very, just out of GQ. Um, you know, young, uh, just like he literally looked like he was in a magazine and he said that he was living in Davenport. Now Davenport, Iowa is not (laughs) very sexy. Okay. It's not. And I looked at her and I'm like, do you really think that this guy is living in Davenport? Now, if we were in Chicago, New York, like I could see that that could be a, a, a possibility, but again, go with your gut, your intuition. Like if it seems to be too good to be true, through like, and there's, there's like an asterisk when I say this, because I feel like I'm not, there's like an asterisk with it. But if you're looking at someone's online dating profile, just like kind of what you've said in the past, like with military profiles and uniforms, like, does this, does this seem to be something that this person would be doing? Or why would they, if it feels like it's, there's something a little bit off, most likely there is. The second thing that I always tell people is that, from the moment it's important to once you swipe, so you're there for connection, not for a texting buddy, <laughs> not to like have a relationship and develop a relationship over text, but to connect. So when you swipe on someone and it's a match, follow up with that match immediately. So whether it's, you know, I always tell people to, um, I don't know if you heard it on that, on that show that I was on, but the men were like, I was teaching them about how to approach someone's DMS on the online dating profile. And please don't know, please do not put, Hey, what's up by please, 
please. Because women will go, no, thanks. <laughs> thanks a lot. <laughs> um, but the second, you know, make a connection after you swipe and there's a match, make that connection. So either you can prompt like by looking at their profile and at, at profile and asking them a question or the other way around, you know, having them contact you the moment of contact, get them off the app and into real life as fast as possible. This, what I mean by that is going from the DMS on your app to, and a lot of people are kind of uncomfortable with the phone, but you can go to the DMS and say, Hey, what are you doing this Friday night? Or it would be great to move this message, you know, to move this conversation off the app. What are you doing this weekend? Or I would love to see you in real life, something to where to keep the motivation going, because whether or not this is a fake profile or a real profile, the key is to not to get in this texting relationship with this person is to really like, you're here to connect. You're here to, to hopefully find someone, right? So why wouldn't you not want to meet them in real life? Um, so I always had like this 24 to 48 hour rule, get them off the app, get them in real time. Now, if you can't connect like face to face within that time frame, FaceTime, absolutely FaceTime. If you can do FaceTime and being like, Hey, let's, if the conversation's going great, you're texting each other back and forth again, move it to FaceTime so that that eliminates whether or not this person's a real person. Um, it kind of will put your mind at ease and then try to move them into real life as quickly as possible. Yeah. Don't so do that. Don't do uh, yours truly two years. Uh, he's overseas, but I didn't know any better. And honestly coming, and from, it was a different time. It was, it a was different time. and coming from being married for so long, that yeah. was this, I thought the safe thing because I wasn't ready for something in person. At least yeah. that's what I was telling myself, you know, and I probably right. was, but that's, that is important is that I see if you haven't seen the whites of his eyes and it used to be online, but if in person within two weeks, then it's a no-go. It's a no-go. You got to meet him in person uh, because we found in our work at SCARS, which is the Society of Citizens Against Relationship Scams, there's the, the psychology of a scam and it's what we call the amygdala hijack. It's the little part of your brain that gets that bomb of love, you know, and the hormones are going and now you're not thinking straight. And, right. and you think you are, you believe you're hearing what you want to, you know, what you want and what you need. Right. And really you're just right. believing, you're believing what you, what you want to hear. Uh, and it's interesting because they won't call you by your first name. And that's a big flag for us is if they don't call you by your name, if they don't text you or write to you by your name, not honey, sweetheart, lovey your name, because if somebody calls you Debbie and your name is Kat, ding, 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 you know, he's working, right. hundreds, he's working hundreds of girls. Uh, so That's it's right. really important. And, and I agree with you on the text. I, I actually had that conversation with my, my boys as they were dating before they got married because so many, and my daughter too, she, she knows this. Um, you can't feel the emotion through a text. And it's too easy to misinterpret what somebody says through a text for good yes. or for bad and never have a serious conversation through texting because you never. just can't hear what's really happening. And so I agree with that. And be careful when you're moving off the site, don't go to uh, WhatsApp or Google Hangouts. Those are not real life. Those are full, right. full of scammers. Uh, even with online, you know, we've seen with our, uh, artificial intelligence that the scammers can actually change. They can come on live, but they can change what people are saying. And so just be really careful. So in your, in your world, meet them in person. And we're going to jump into that because you have some such fun things. Um, Cause you talk about creative ways to get people together. Now that the pandemic is kind of slowing down. I say yes. that kind of, cause we were just away for 4th of July with eight couples and half of them have come down with COVID since we got home. So I'm sitting here going, oh, is my sore throat part of it? Or am I just getting the cold? But let's say that, that we can get out and about in person now. Tell us about right. what you're doing and the fun stuff that you're doing to encourage singles to get together. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So this is one of my favorite things about what I do is um, creating new and unique ways for singles to connect. And you're absolutely right. I think 
Um, one of the reasons that I got catapulted into this, into this work, it was because of the pandemic, because so many singles were feeling like they were missing out that they, I think the pandemic with the isolation, they really felt that it was, you know, it was time to, to let someone in and to start putting themselves out there. And so I just try to help and make that easy because, uh, singles, uh, think that there's only two solutions and one of them is being the bar and one of them is being online. And so I, I tried to, uh, put these events together. So I do some basic events, which is speed dating. So speed dating is a great and unique way of making connections. In fact, that was one of the things when I was single, um, I went to a speed dating event, even though I didn't meet any good quality guys. I met one of my best friends, her and I connected at the bar. She was like, what are you doing after this? I'm like, nothing. Like we like instantly bonded and became like best friends after that. So it's, it's, I think it's important to mention that it's my events are hopefully to bring romance into your life, but also just to bring connection. Like it's just to make some great friends and to put yourself out there. So speed dating being one of them. Um, I did headshot happy hour, which is a lot of the men, um, need help with their online dating profiles, right? Ladies. Um, so, uh, that's one of my, one of the things that I did was do headshot app hour where they came and had some cocktails. Yeah. No, no, no. Describe that because it's so funny. I remember when I first started online dating, I was looking at those pictures like, why in the world does he have that wife beater t-shirt, you know, no sleeves or hanging on a motorcycle <sighs> with another woman. And I'm like, what is wrong with these men? And so that cracked me up when you talked to the guys, how did the guys that you were describing that to, how did they take it? Cause yeah. They're oh, they're no, they're, I mean, I think it's, I, you know, um, the men that I work with are amazing. They're, uh, they just, they need help. They, they, they know that they need to like, cause a lot of them, um, were, uh, divorced, you know, it was like almost like a dear John letter. And like one of my clients, um, his wife ended up, um, telling him that he was gay. Like there's just, there's a lot of good men that are out there that just need assistance. And so they're very open and warm. And so like me, like going through their online dating profiles and like providing, um, you know, headshots. And so coincidentally, my office is right next to a photo studio. So her and I collaborated and they came and they had some head, they got some cocktails, they had some headshots with her. And then they came and I got some online dating advice with me. And it was a, it was a huge success. And I feel like, uh, you know, for me, it's, it's just telling you more and more that it's both men and women that are really seeking connection and, and wanting, um, and wanting love in their lives. So I've done that. I've done, um, like different, like board games and brews I've got, I mean, I have so many different ideas of different events. I've done singles mixers. And, um, I think that, at the end of the, at the end of it, it's just whatever I can do to create creativity along with allowing singles to connect is ultimately my goal, which led me to why, um, my biggest connection, which is I have a live dating game show that I do here in my community that I call game for love, because as a performer, I'm a natural performer. I've been a performer ever since I can long as I can remember, I was really missing the stage, uh, when my dance studio closed. And so I had a great working relationship with the local theater here and I had watched every dating show through the pandemic. Sorry, Brian. I feel I like I had like every, like we would get done with one series and he's like, all right, which one are we watching next? I'm like, okay, which one are we watching next? Um, so I watched like all of these and it was because of the push of, of him, or he was looking at me and he's like, why isn't this something that you're doing? Like why you could be, you could pre- you know be doing something like this. So I had this concept of game for love, where it was like a cross between if you're like, I know this is dating me, but love connection and the dating game and, um, where I put contestants on stage and then, um, everyone had an, the audience members had an app on their phone and they got to vote who they went on a date with. And then we had like a little like faux, uh, restaurant set up upstairs for cupcakes and cocktails. And so the couples went up as I was conducting the rest of the show, the couples went up, had their little fake date. And at the end, we got to know whether or not they were a match. And if they were a match, then I had local restaurants sponsor gift certificates. And then they actually got to go on dates. And it was such a huge success. I had 200 people over there, um, in attendance. Um, this was back in March to where I'm doing it again. So I'm doing it again in October. And ultimately my goal, if I was to shoot really high, um, is to have this turn into like a docu-series on Netflix. I would love to go from town, like from city to city and really highlight all of the amazingness of singles because the problem with 
The problem with dating reality shows is that it's the drama that brings people in, yeah. right? I get it. But with live entertainment, it's different. You can showcase all of the greatness of each one and every single one of these singles so that the audience feels connected. It's like America's got talent. So America's got talent does all the stories of everyone. And you have these feels and then like they hit the golden buzzer. Like to me, helping, help, helping singles find love is the golden buzzer in my show. And so like, that's really what I want to do a big picture. Yeah. yeah, but you could even franchise it. That could, I mean, because you're in, yes, in I know. Iowa and I've got folks that are on the show here watching from New York and from uh, England and I'm thinking yeah. they're not going to fly to Iowa for this thing in October, but give us the date. When are you doing it in October? October 8th, uh, 2022. And the big goal is to hopefully eventually get it um, live streamed, but I'm just like a little like small business that's trying to get my footing. And so just, yeah, stay tuned. And it's funny. Cause like I'll um, meet other people and people will ask me because I, one of the, one of my passions is Instagram. So I do Instagram reels. Um, you could see that the actress part of me come out in those things and people are like, why aren't you on TV? I'm like, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Getting there slowly, but surely, but yeah, yeah but be careful with Instagram. <laughs> I got a message the other day and I'm never on Instagram and it was something like so-and-so is following you. Well, good looking guy. Right. So I get online, I get on my Instagram account and out of 360 followers, 350 of them were scammers. And I could tell just by looking at them. Yeah. And I was like, ah, yeah. what a problem. So I'm sitting there, you know, swiping left, <laughs> delete, delete, delete. Um, so just be careful. Yes. But I, what a great idea because you're getting people together in person. That's yes, the key exactly. is in person and you're kind of yes. guiding them and you're the buddy, you're the dating buddy cat. You are just the dating yeah. buddy. And, and I love that. And so once you get them together, how do you follow mm -hmm. on? What is your program after the fact with helping these singles? Cause you said one time as a successful coach, love coach, especially your goal is to not have these people as your clients for life. That's right. No, I don't like want a parent you. cut the cord and let them fly. <laughs> That's right. How did That's you right. get to that point where you say, don't need me anymore? Um, so I think it's it's a case by case basis. So every every client is unique and different in what they're in and what they need. And and I think it's it's important to mention that usually what clients come to me, what they what they think they come to me because they think that they know what they need. And my job is to show them really what they do need. And so um, you know, for me, whether it's matchmaking or whether it's dating coaching you know, you have your own specific goal of what that is, whether it's to be a more empowered dater, just to have more of a clarification of what it is that you're looking for. Or maybe it's something where it's like, what's going on? Like after my first date, I can't seem to get to the second date. So it's part of the dissecting of trying to figure out really what's holding you back. Like what, what are the, what are you swiping on? What is, what are you allowing into your life? Who are you saying yes to? Who are you saying no to? That's important too. And, um, ultimately, like if a client comes to me, whether it's a month by month basis, which, you know, my one-on-one -on -one coaching is that way, because sometimes you need me for something to solve an issue like right away or something. It's, it's something that you need something that's more long-term and the matchmaking aspect of what I do, the follow-through is very, very different. So I'm specifically like vetting people to bring them together and then the follow up with that is after every date, you know, for me to learn from both parties, how is this person as a dater? What is it that this person can improve on? And also from my client standpoint, was this person a match? Were they not a match? What can I learn more about you and about what you're looking for in order to ultimately lead to um, lead you to relationship success? So I think it's whatever your end goal is, of course, the really the end goal for everyone is to hopefully help them find, uh, uh, their forever person. Um, but I think that sometimes they feel that that's the, that that's the solution when sometimes it might even be just the love that they need to find for themselves first. So, well, I, I give you so much credit because it's, it's interesting after my online dating, I did jump back into dating again, but I found my love through friends who were matchmakers. And yes. when you hear matchmaker, you know, it takes me back and dates me. I'm thinking Fiddler on the Roof and, you know, the old lady. Right. Uh, and and, I, and it's funny because I did go to see Fiddler on the Roof in Denver with my, my late husband. And what a blast. Had such a good time. But Aww. just like online dating a little bit, 
I you kind of you're skeptical about, you know, do I tell anybody that I met him through a matchmaker? I'm thinking, oh, oh my gosh, yeah. the matchmaker was wonderful because they did the background checks. They they knew that we were both, you know, professionals. And it, it took a lot of the wasted time away from my life because yes. I, I they knew what I needed. They knew knew they knew I needed somebody that was geographically desirable, as I put it, you know, within 10 minutes. Um and they just knew what kind of person I was because they'd interviewed me. They had interviewed him. There was extensive work done prior to our first date. Yes. A lot of work on you. So it's not inexpensive, but for me, it was worth it. So uh, absolutely. How are you getting your clients? Are they just local folks? Or are you bringing people in from around the world? Yeah. Um, yeah. Right now it's just local. Uh, and I, and I think, um, you know, you bring up a really good point. I think the, one of the key things about a matchmaker is exposing you and introducing you to people that you most likely would have swiped left on. In fact, when they did a survey of 400 couples, 400 successful couples, only 11% of them confessed that they would have swiped right on one another. Interesting. All the rest would have never given each other the time of day. So I think it's, a matchmaker is it's so much different than just finding someone it's, it's really finding someone that you normally might've not have found for yourself. So, and it's, it's, it is, it is a luxury service, right? It, it, it saves you time and energy and gives that and gives that all of that trust to me in order to help you find someone. Um, as far as like, I do currently work locally, but I have access to matchmakers all over the world. So I belong to the matchmaking Alliance. We have calls every month. And so I have matchmaker connections all over. So if a matchmaker is someone that you're looking for, I can find you. If I, if it's not something that I can do for you, it's definitely, I can find you a, an amazing matchmaker who can absolutely help you. So that's, yes. that's neat. So how can people contact you? Well, um, they can go to my website, which is theheartagency.com. And there is one of my passions is talking about attachment theory, which we didn't really discuss, but I have a quiz on there where you can find out your own attachment style. So it's just right there on the website. You can take the little short quiz and you can find out more about yourself and you're knowing your attachment theory is, or knowing your attachment style is really imperative when it comes to dating. You can also, um, find me on Facebook or Instagram cat Cantrell. So C A T C A N T R I L L. I spend a lot of time over there and, um, yeah, that's basically, those are the, those are the two major places where you can find, and you me, can so. find yeah. her in Iowa on October 8th. Yeah. Yes. Live. Oh, and my podcast, dear matchmaker. There's yeah. that too. My podcast. It, yeah. Give us, give us that again. What's it called? Dear matchmaker. So dear it's, matchmaker. I answer, I have amazing guests like yourself. And then I answer questions from like my clients and potential clients who are like, I have this question. Can you answer it for me? So yeah, it's that, I that love was it. so much fun. I really had a, had a blast and it's very interesting. You know, you, when you go to a, a matchmaker, you don't think that she's going to have someone on that, you know, was scammed out of so much money, but it happens. And, and folks, honestly, I got an email this morning from a young woman whose mother uh, has been scammed so far out of $150,000. And she was just ready. I think she had actually gotten a rever reverse mortgage on her home. She was waiting for this guy to come back from overseas so that they could buy a home in Hawaii. And she would live her rest of her life there. And this gal was just <sighs> desperate to say, Deb, can you talk to my mother? And what can we do? And it's very involved. But if anybody is in that situation, please go to romancescamsnow.com and look up the Society of Citizens Against Relationship Scams or SCARS. I'm on the board of directors there. I've lived it for 10 years. And it just makes me so sad that social media and big companies aren't taking this seriously. So Kat, I thank you for having me as a guest on your show because we need to raise awareness. And I thank you me for too. being a guest on my show because I have women that I work with that really want to know that they're good people, that there is somebody out there for them and they just need a buddy. They need a matchmaker buddy. And you're my yes. go-to buddy right now. So thank you so much for being here. Any last word? No, um, 
Uh, the last word is, is I think that as singles, especially when we're constantly faced with, we feel like that we're going to be single forever. It can be really easy to think that maybe you're destined to be single. And I just want to tell you that you're not, and that your person is out there. Um, and if you ever need help finding that person, you can always contact me personally, cat at the heart agency.com. There we go. Thank you so much. My new friend. I love what you're doing. Thank you. And, uh, thank you. I love what you're doing. I appreciate you. So we've got the mutual admiration society you. today on stand up and speak up and everybody. Thank you so much for another wonderful show and go out there and have a great day. Be safe, be happy and beware and be aware. Take care. Yes. Thanks dear. Thank you for listening to stand up and speak up. We are dedicated to encouraging you to remove the mask of embarrassment and to being your best self. If you are the victim of a scam or cybercrime, please visit againstscams.org for assistance and guidance about options and recovery. SCARS, the Society of Citizens Against Relationship Scams, is an incorporated nonprofit crime victims assistance organization based in Miami, Florida, supporting scam victims worldwide. If you can, make a small donation to help victims around the world receive the help they need. This episode has been sponsored by BenfoComplete.com, a vitamin supplement company that supports happy and healthy hands and feet for those with neuropathy. If you or anyone you know struggles with the pins and needles or numbness in their hands and feet, check out our Benfoteaming products at BenfoComplete.com. Use the special code STANDUP for a 5% discount on your purchase. Again, thank you for being with us today. Go to my website, The Woman Behind the Smile, for additional resources and information. Subscribe to my YouTube channel and enjoy the replays. My books are all available on Amazon.com and Audible, and I encourage you to join us again. Have a great day.